This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. The heart longing of every Christian for the last 2,000 years has been to see the Saviour return and set up an everlasting kingdom on earth. Events in the world reveal that this will happen very soon. Keep listening to learn how you can spiritually prepare for earth's final events. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. Baptism, traditional ceremony, important symbol, outmoded rite. Hi, I'm Miles Roby, and you're listening to World's Last Chance Radio. Baptism has actually been around a very long time. Uh, John the Baptist wasn't the first to introduce baptism. The Jews understood baptism as being symbolic for purification. Early Mesopotamia and Egypt, as well as some indigenous religions in the Americas and the Far East, all practiced various forms of baptism. Now, for Christians, though, it's a very specific purpose, and one that is too frequently being overlooked today. And I've asked Dave Wright to talk to us about that today. Dave. Thanks, Miles. Yes, well, as a boy, whenever someone was baptised at church, it always seemed really special. Now, it didn't happen very often, but it was a it was a kind of break in the typical church service routine, and it always seemed so fascinating to see the baptismal tank filled with water and someone, usually an adult, being baptised in it. Yeah, I can see how that would be. I mean, for me, I was brought up in a church that practised infant baptism. It was always fascinating to watch too as well. You know, the baby would be fine right up until the cold water hit its head. Uh, and there'd be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You know, it was, it was all very predictable. And as a kid, I always found it quite amusing. Uh, it wasn't very nice of me, I know. I'm, I'm sure it was stressful for the mothers, but I always found it very amusing. Yeah, I know where you're coming from with that. Well, we never actually had anything quite like that. But there is a book called Even the Angels Must Laugh. Now, this is a compilation of various amusing and true incidents that have happened during church services. And apparently, this one church installed a baptismal tank that had a glass front to it. Now, for baptism by immersion, if there are several people being baptised, they usually have the women go out one side and the men go out the other so that they can then go and change into dry clothes afterwards. Mm. Well, this one time, a man got turned around and exited the wrong side. (laughs) But the time he'd figured out his mistake, the next baptismal candidate was down in the tank. So he thought that it would be too awkward to re-enter the tank from the ladies' side and, and walk back across. So... He actually came up with another plan instead. Do I want to hear this one? (laughs) Well, you can be the judge of that. (laughs) Okay. Let's give him credit for creativity. He completely forgot that the baptismal tank was glass-fronted, and as the pastor dunked the person under, he slipped under the water too and swam across to the other side underwater, all in full view of the onlooking congregation. (laughs) That must have been a sight to see, honestly. <laughs> well, I should think it was rather distracting, I should think. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, you yeah, have to give him points for trying, honestly. Sure. Uh, seriously, though, I- I'd really like to talk about the purpose for baptism. Is it still necessary or is it, I don't know, more optional, I guess? The reason I'm asking is that I had a conversation recently at a family get-together and my wife's cousin is a pastor uh, in a denomination that is known for being on the conservative end of the scale. Now, I think that's why his comment surprised me so much. It's, It's not something I'd expect to hear from a conservative Christian. He said that baptism is just a ritual that allows believers to make a public display or statement of their private faith and convictions. Well, I've heard that before, but presumably you disagree. Well, at least partially, Dave, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it gives believers the opportunity to make a public statement about their faith, yeah, sure, but at the same time, it's, it's more than that, isn't it? You know, I think that's where I, I really disagreed with him. You see, I think that it's necessary for salvation, 
He, on the other hand, insisted that baptism is greatly misunderstood if you take it to be an outright requirement. So, yeah, I guess I'm looking today for some kind of clarity on that. How are we to view baptism? Is it just a chance to make a public statement about faith or or is it something more, Dave? Well, those are all good questions. Now, views on baptism have changed among some Christians in recent years. But as always, let's see what the Bible has to say. So could you firstly turn to Matthew chapter 28 and Mm -hmm. read for us verses 16 to 20? This passage is often referred to as the Great Commission because here Yahushua is giving his disciples some final instructions before his ascension to heaven. It takes place after his crucifixion and he's telling them what their work is to be. So you've got it there. So could we hear Matthew 28 verses 16 to 20? Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Yahushua had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Yahushua came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So here we've got Yahushua's instructions to the disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So what's he doing here? Uh, well, he's telling them what they're to do as apostles. He's, he's laying out their work, isn't he? Did the apostles take his words to be as helpful career suggestions, or did they take them as inspired commands? Well, when you look at what tradition says they did, well, I'd have to say that they seem to have taken Christ's words quite literally. Of course. Andrew is said to have gone to the land of the man-eaters in what is today known as Russia. Philip took the gospel down into northern Africa and Asia Minor, and Matthew ministered in Persia and Ethiopia. Ah, Thomas, good old doubting Thomas, you know, was so committed to following the Saviour's instructions that he took the gospel straight through to India. Right. So I'd say they all took the Saviour's words rather literally, wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, it sounds that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is, as we said a moment ago, views on the importance, dare I say the necessity of baptism, have changed. It's no longer viewed as a vital part of salvation. It's a more comfortable tradition. Certainly a public statement of faith, but also often a way to bind the next generation to your preferred flavour of church. (laughs) Preferred flavour of church. (laughs) Make it like an ice cream shop or something. (laughs) Yes, but you know what I mean, I think. Yeah, 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 I mean, I do. You see, sometimes it seems people are more focused on what divides their different denominations than what unites them. One area I've seen the shift in mentality is in the songs that we sing. Now, personally, I, I love the old hymns. I really do. You know, such, such a depth to their lyrics, isn't there? And some of my favourites were written over a thousand years ago. Now, the hymns have a depth that I just don't find in modern praise songs. For, for example, okay, Dave, right. So there's a hymn by William Cowper written oof, all the way back in 1770. The first verse says, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Okay, and then the other verse goes, Thou dying lamb, thy precious blood, shall never lose its power, till all the ransomed church of God are saved to sin no more. Mm. Yes, I like that one too. Uh, And you're also right that many, not all, but most of the modern praise and worship songs, they do lack the depth that's found in the old hymns. Mm, Absolutely. They're repetitive, aren't they? They just repeat the same words over and over and over and over again. Uh, But more than that, I've noticed that baptism is not a subject they like to sing about. They like to sing about everything else in praise songs, but... Not baptism. Mm. And it's a reflection of changing attitudes about baptism, I think. Yeah, and it's really too bad. The truth is that people in the past had a more correct understanding of baptism than many people today. And actually, I contend that baptism is an absolute necessity. And yet, many believers today take a very casual attitude towards baptism, almost as though it's optional. In fact, recently I was visiting with some fellow Christians on this very subject. 
Uh, one person vehemently stated that if a person truly understands what he called the New Covenant Scriptures on Baptism, then they'll know that the only baptism we need today is baptism in the Word of Yah. What? Yeah, it's just baptism in the Word. No, I'm, I'm serious. What does that even mean? Well, it's word salad, isn't it, that doesn't really mean anything, and especially because the Gospel Commission we read earlier specifically states that we are to go and teach and, and, and baptise. No offence, but it sounds like your friend was suffering from a serious level of ignorance about what the Bible actually teaches, yeah, to be honest. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, yes, exactly. Scripture's very clear that baptism is more than an option. Could you just turn to Luke chapter 24? Um, mm -hmm. Luke 24, and read verses uh, 44 through to 49. Now, this is the last chapter of Luke, as you'll see there, Miles. And this is after Christ's death. Directly after this, it talks about Yahushua's ascension. So take this in the context of what Matthew recorded of Yahushua's instructions to go and teach all nations, baptizing them. Okay, Luke 24, verses 44 to 49. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Matthew adds in the detail that they were to baptize those who accepted the gospel message. But the point remains that these are Yahushua's final instructions to his disciples just before his ascension. He's even telling them to wait in Jerusalem for the promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This isn't optional. These are their marching orders, if you like. Now, let's go fast forward to Pentecost. What attitude did the newly ordained apostles, ordained just that morning by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, what attitude did they take toward baptism? Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 39. Now, this is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Yahushua Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Repent and be baptised. Is baptism necessary for being filled with the Holy Spirit? I think we'd all agree we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is water baptism necessary for that? Well, let's take a look at the story of Cornelius. Now, you may remember that he was a Roman centurion in Caesarea. He sent and asked Peter to come. There was some initial hesitation, because traditionally the Jews would never enter the homes of the uncircumcised. But Peter goes. And let's read what happened. Acts chapter 10. Uh, I can't remember which verse it's actually. Uh, I think it was verses 44 to 48, actually. Okay. And it says, While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling Yahweh. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Yahushua Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. So notice that just because these Gentile believers were already baptised with the Holy Spirit, Peter did not decide that water baptism was suddenly no longer necessary. No, in fact, the baptism of the Spirit just gave more weight to his, his argument that they should be baptised with water. Exactly right, yes. And, and this is the same stance that the other apostles took too. Philip baptised the Ethiopian eunuch. Paul and Silas, too, urged physical baptism in water as an important and vital step in salvation. Turn to Acts chapter 10 and read what they told the Philippian jailer after an earthquake loosened their stocks and set them free. Acts 10 
verses 29 to 34, it says, The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Yahushua, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in Yahweh, he and his whole household. The jailer was saved. He expressed faith in the Saviour and accepted the gift of salvation, and yet Paul and Silas still baptised him. And let me tell you, back then, at night, there wasn't any baptismal tank filled with preheated water just standing around, and yet mm. baptism was still deemed important enough that they still did it. Yeah, are there any exceptions at all to this? Well, yes, of course there are. Humans are dogmatic and judge each other. Not ya. John 5.22 says that the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment unto the Son. And what does the Son say? John chapter 8, verse 11. Uh, one second. Uh, neither do I condemn you. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and he gets people judging each other. Judging others is a favourite pastime of the Laodicean End Generation Church. You build yourself up, make yourself feel better about your own failings by comparing yourself to others, looking down on them and judging them as worse off than yourself. So what are some exceptions to the rule then? Well, obviously, if there is some physical impairment that would keep a person from being baptised, for some, perhaps they're in prison and they're not allowed. Uh, as I've said it before, and I'll say it again, Yah reads the heart. He knows if it is in the heart to obey, or to look for some excuse to get out of what the natural heart views as a, as a disagreeable chore. You see, this is where faith comes into the equation. The thief on the cross is an excellent example of an exception due to extreme extenuating circumstances. Are there any instances in which sprinkling would be acceptable then? Well, sure. Again, if someone is truly unable to be baptised by immersion and has no other option, then it is the faith expressed in the act that has value, not the particulars. That said, I do not believe that the baptism of infants is acceptable. Infant baptism came in after the doctrine of hell was introduced. You don't want an infant to end up in an eternally burning hell, so you baptise him real quick. And this is all very works orientated. You jump through this hoop to save your child an eternity of torture. Baptism should always occur when someone is old enough to make a conscious choice for him or herself. OK, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. In trying to describe the Saviour's and the Heavenly Father's love for sinners, we often use metaphors in an attempt to comprehend the incomprehensible. We say their love is as deep as the ocean, or as wide as the sky. It is important to contemplate such love because only love can awaken love. Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, To love someone deeply gives you strength. Being loved by someone deeply gives you courage. When we know the Father and the Son, it is our privilege to know them. When we enter into that close, intimate relationship with them, we'll experience both the strength that comes from loving deeply and the courage that comes from being loved deeply. To try to communicate the depths of pure love, Scripture uses analogies linking the Father's love to the dearest associations of the human heart. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 5 tells us that Yahweh is our husband. As our husband, he longs for a closer, more intimate relationship than we have previously experienced. The Saviour does too. In fact, believers in the final generation have a unique opportunity and privilege to join with the Saviour in the work of saving souls. 
This special relationship drawing believers closer to both the Father and the Son is so close that believers are referred to as the Bride of Christ. To learn more, look for the radio episode called The Bride of Christ. Learn how you, too, can enjoy the blessings of such a love relationship. Listen to The Bride of Christ. Previously aired radio programmes can be heard on our website at worldslastchance.com or on YouTube. Look for it today. We were just talking about exceptions, so let's take a look at the story of the thief on the cross. Could you read it for us, please, Miles? Mm-hmm. It's uh, Luke chapter 23, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's uh, verse 39 to 43, and it says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Yahushua, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Yahushua said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. It's important to notice what the second thief actually says. His sense of injustice is triggered when the first thief ridicules and mocks the Saviour. He says, aren't you even afraid of Yah when you're under the exact same condemnation? And in addition to that, our condemnation is just because we've broken the law, but he hasn't done anything wrong. So it's a confession of guilt as well as a rebuke. And then in his very next statement, you can see his faith. And it's a beautiful thing. Here is Yahushua, crucified, scourged, unrecognisable after the beatings and torture before the crucifixion, and yet in this man he sees the Messiah, his Redeemer, and he puts that faith into words. Lord, he says, using a respectful title, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's an incredibly beautiful statement of faith. It is, and and obviously the Saviour accepted that as the best he could do under those circumstances because obviously he, he couldn't be baptised. He wasn't getting off his cross alive. Right, over and over in the New Testament, whenever someone would ask how they can be saved, the Apostles' response was clear. Repent and be baptised. For the stories recorded in Scripture, it's clear that the baptism they were talking about was baptism by water, not some mystical baptism of the word. It's a very simple, very clear statement. Repent and be baptised. It's not something we're to spiritualise away. Yeah, it's true. I mean, furthermore, when we spiritualise away clear commands in Scripture, we're, we're straying into forbidden ground, looking for ways to shrug away clear requirements is rebellion, uh, disobedience, if, if you will. In Mark chapter 7, verse 13, Yahushua makes it very clear that we're not to make the clear word of Yah of no effect with our excuses and explanations and traditions. So let me ask you this then, Dave. So now that we've seen the baptism, it's it's a literal requirement, you know, one we are to obey. Just how are our sins forgiven when we're baptised in Yahushua's name? I mean, it's, it's only water, isn't it? Why or how does that have such a vital impact that it is what causes our sins to be forgiven? Well, it's all got to do with the motives of the heart. Again, Yahuwah reads the hidden, inner heart. You're forgiven and cleansed of sin when you are baptised because you have obeyed the command to be baptised. Lucifer fell through rebellion. How did Adam and Eve fall? Uh, rebellion. Well, disobedience, but that's still rebellion, isn't it? And the opposite of rebellion is obedience. It is the obedience in the heart, the desire of the heart to honour Yah through obeying his word that forgives and cleanses us from sin. Peter explains it best, in fact. So why don't you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and let's read what he has to say there. Uh, 1 Peter, 1 Peter, okay, right. It's one of those little tiny books, isn't it, that's really impossible to find. Oh, go on, Miles, you can do it. I've got faith in you, you know. (laughs) Really have. Uh, Okay, right. uh, First and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus, Hebrews, James. Peter. Okay, right, Peter. Peter. 
Um, yes. Peter, Peter, Peter what? It's uh, First Peter, chapter 3, <laughs> verses 18 to 22. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to Yah. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when Yahuwah waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to Yah for a good conscience through the resurrection of Yahushua Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of Yah, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The forgiveness and cleansing that is Yah's gift comes when we repent and truly desire to bring our will into alignment with the divine will. Then we make determined efforts to obey, to keep the law, to bring our will into oneness with the divine will. This doesn't mean that even through faith we're suddenly sinless. We still have a fallen nature, so as long as we have that fallen nature, we will still stumble into sin. But it does mean that obedience, oneness with the Father, is in our hearts. If you were to read through the Levitical requirements in the Old Testament, you will find detailed instructions on where the blood of the sacrifices was to be applied. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't it supposed to be applied to the base and horns of the altar? Yes, and in Egypt to the lintel and doorposts. When cleansing Aaron and his sons, the blood was applied to their right ears, right thumbs and right big toes, all very precise requirements. Now, let me ask you this. What would have been the result if some Israelite in Egypt had decided that painting the door frame with blood was a bit too stinky? He sacrificed the lamb, but he didn't apply the blood. What do you think would have happened? Well, I think the consequences would have been quite tragic, to be honest, wouldn't they? Exactly right, yes. And that was only a type. The blood shed then was a type, a symbol, pointing forward to the blood of the Lamb of Yah who takes away the sin of the world. Now, let me ask you this. If in the type, the symbol, the blood had to be applied, then in the antitype, the fulfilment, the reality, why wouldn't the blood also have to be applied? Uh, Well, yeah, I suppose it just makes sense that that it would have to be, wouldn't it? And the way that it is applied is baptism. Why wouldn't you want to have the redeeming blood of Christ applied? True, 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 true. But how precisely does the water of baptism provide that cleansing that we actually need? I mean, the fact that it applies the blood clearly shows beyond a shadow of doubt that that baptism, whenever and wherever possible, is a very important act, not just some unnecessary outmoded ritual. Yeah, uh, and that's a really good question, actually. And of course, Scripture has the answer to it. So let's turn to uh, John chapter 19. This is John's account of the crucifixion, and it is in John that we learn that the crucifixion took place on the sixth day of the week. Now, Christ's enemies, the Pharisees, were, as we know, very careful to keep to the strict letter of the law. This was the preparation day, and the sun was setting. Death by crucifixion typically took several days, and they didn't want to leave the bodies on the crosses over the Sabbath, so they got permission to hasten their deaths. Uh, Could you start reading uh, John 19, and start at verse 31, please? Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Yahushua and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. Blood and water. This was the cleansing tide that had been in Yah's mind from eternity past as the solution should sin arise. It was this dual stream designed to show his love and cleanse sinners. So if we don't understand the significance of this dual stream and what each is to accomplish for us, we're missing an important part of the great plan of salvation. 
Let's now turn to Mark chapter 16. We've read the Great Commission in Matthew, as well as Peter's statement on the day of Pentecost, so let's now read what Mark recorded. It's Mark chapter 16, verses 14 to 16. Okay, well, let's see. This is after Yahushua's resurrection, uh, and it says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. There's a little three-word phrase there that we just tend to skim over, but it's important. Verse 16, could you just read that again? He who believes and is baptised will be saved. He who believes and is baptised. Baptism is important. It is the blood of Christ that brings Yah's forgiveness, but it's the water of baptism that cleanses us. Well, yeah, I mean, it's all in a single act of obedience. You know, I've, I've, I've never actually viewed baptism as a, an outmoded ritual, but I've never viewed it quite this way before. I mean, this is really beautiful. It really is, yes. Now, there is something else that most Christians today overlook or, or perhaps don't understand. Blood also ratifies the new covenant. The old covenant was ratified by the blood of animals, but the new covenant is ratified by the blood of our Redeemer. So could you read Hebrews chapter 9, and we're looking for verses 19 to 23. It's a very interesting passage, this. Hebrews 9, verses 19 to 23. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats, with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The animal sacrifices were a type which pointed forward to the great antitype, Yahushua, the Lamb of Yah. He was the better sacrifice. Now just turn the page to Hebrews chapter 10, and we're looking for verse 29. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the son of Yah underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. Yahushua's blood is what ratifies the new covenant which will allow Yahweh to give us new, unfallen natures when Yahushua returns to set up Yah's kingdom on earth. You see, I'm just thinking now of a, a number of various passages in Scripture, and they're, they're all coming alive right now, like the, the Passover. Yahuwah told the children of Israel that when he saw the blood on their doors, he would pass over them. And what Yahushua told Peter, you remember at the Last Supper, hmm. uh, Peter didn't want the Saviour to wash his feet, but then Yahushua explained something important. He said, if I don't wash you, then you have no part with me. Right, yes, and there is so much depth of meaning there. Just turn to Colossians chapter 3, because this passage here really pulls all of this together. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Okay, right. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of Yah. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in Yah. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The blood and the water. One hides us with Christ in Yah, the other cleanses us. Let's just take a few moments now to talk about communion. Let's turn to Mark chapter 14 and look at verses uh, 22 to 24. And what do they say? And as they were eating, Yahushua took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. 
probably every Christian alive understands the significance of the bread and the wine. They're emblems, symbols of Christ's body and blood. Probably every denomination has some way of celebrating the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, after talking about the Last Supper, Paul lays the foundation for believers to continue this practice. He says, quote, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. The thing most Christians have overlooked, however, is the significance of what happened before. We mentioned it briefly, but now let's actually read it in context. It's John chapter 13, verses 3 through to 15. Just start reading it as soon as you've got it. Yahushua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from Yahuwah and was going to Yahuwah, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Yahushua answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Yahushua answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Yahushua said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you should do as I have done to you. Now, sometimes when we talk about the Last Supper, we kind of get this idea that they all trooped into the upper room and sat down and then stared awkwardly at each other, waiting for a servant to come and wash their feet. Then, after Yahushua does the deed, they proceed with the meal. But that's not how it happened. Now, you started reading at verse 3 there. What I'd like you to do now is to go back and read the first few verses again. But this time, I want you to start at verse 2. Okay. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Yahushua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from Yahuwah and was going to Yahuwah, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And supper being ended, this Mm. was what he did. He washed the disciples' feet. The foot washing is part of the commemorative rite. Yahushua himself in verses 14 to 15 says what? If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And yet, what do the vast majority of denominations conveniently forget to do every time they either have mass or celebrate the Last Supper? The foot washing service. The foot washing service. And do you know why? Oh, it's embarrassing. It's awkward. Do we really have to touch someone else's feet? Some churches actually refer to it as the ordinance of humility. But Yahushua said, You also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. The reason the foot washing service is so important is because it is part of the remembrance that symbolises the water of baptism. The bread and the wine represent the Saviour's body and blood that brings forgiveness, but it is the foot washing that symbolises the cleansing of the water of baptism. Mm, So true. You see, Satan doesn't mind if we claim forgiveness, as long as we overlook the cleansing part of the equation. Both blood and water flowed from the Saviour's side and both the blood of the sacrifice and the cleansing water of baptism are needed, and both are symbolised in the communion service and the foot washing. 
But in our pride, we don't like to wash each other's feet. We explain it away, just like too many today are shrugging away the importance of baptism. Both are important and both are needed. The foot washing reminds us of the cleansing that comes through baptism. It's beautiful and it's something we'll want to participate in if we wish to honour Yahweh in obedience. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Have you ever felt so guilty, so ashamed, that you felt like you couldn't even come to the Heavenly Father and ask for forgiveness? I have, and it's not a fun experience. In fact, it's deeply discouraging. Usually this happens when I'm struggling with what the Bible calls a besetting sin. You know how it is. You sin, you repent, you ask for forgiveness. You determine never to dishonour the Father like that again. And then you end up sinning again, and in the exact same way as before. If you've ever found yourself trapped in this cycle, I have good news for you. The Saviour came for you. In fact, in Luke 5.32, Yahushua said that he didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you're a sinner, that means he came for you. Don't let shame and embarrassment keep you away from the Father. He accepts all who come to him. Come just as you are. You can't get better away from him, so don't wait to come. He's waiting with arms wide open to accept you. To learn more about this amazing gift of love, look for the radio programme titled Hope for Sinners. Again, that's Hope for Sinners on worldslastchance.com. You can also find it in a variety of different languages on YouTube. Today's question from our daily mailbag is from Nancy in Cleveland, Ohio in the United States. Now, she has a rather heartbreaking question, but one I think many of our listeners can relate to. So she writes, My husband of 62 years passed away last year. We had only one child who died when he was still young. All of my brothers and sisters have passed on, and my husband was the last of his family too. I have a few nieces and nephews, but they live far away and are busy with their own lives and families. I feel so alone. America is a culture that idolizes youth. I feel invisible. Does the Bible have any promises for people in my position? Well, firstly, let me just say how very sorry I am for the loss of your husband. I honestly can't even imagine what it's like to lose a spouse after so many years of marriage. Secondly, yes, the Bible certainly does have promises, specifically for the elderly. Yahuwah knows that we are but dust, and unto dust we will return. He hasn't left the elderly alone. Miles, can you just take your Bible and turn for us to Isaiah Mm -hmm. chapter 46, and uh, read verses 3 to 4. That's Isaiah 46, verses 3 to 4. And I think this passage is particularly apt for Nancy, and, and all like her in similar situations. Okay. Okay. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried from the womb, even to your old age. I am he, and even to grey hairs I will carry you. I have made and will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. Yahweh knows our frailty, he knows our humanness. King David may have had many children, but in his old age, he struggled with fear for the future and feeling alone. In Psalm 37, he said, The steps of a good man are ordered by Yahweh, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for Yahweh upholds him with his hand. And then, in the very next verse, he adds his own personal testimony to Yah's faithfulness. He says, I have been young and now am old, 
yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. From everything I've seen, it can be very scary to be elderly. I mean, you've got the life experience of knowing that sometimes bad things happen to good people. When we're young, it's easy to assume that bad things happen to other people, but with life experience, we learn that sometimes things beyond our control happen and there's nothing we can do about it. One promise that I really appreciate is found in Psalm 138. Let me just quickly look it up for you here on the computer. Um, it, it, just very, very quickly. It's Psalm 138 and verse, actually verses 6 and 7. Now, mm. verse 6 says, Though Yahuwah is on high, yet he regards the lowly. Then in verse 7 it says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. That's wonderful, isn't it? I think one thing that can be very difficult when one loses a spouse is the loss of that sense of companionship. But even here, Yahuwah has promised to fill that hole. In Jeremiah 49, verse 11, Yahuwah urges, quote, Leave thy fatherless children, I will preserve them alive, and let thy widows trust in me. Mm, I haven't read that one before. That's really nice. Uh, one I do like, though, is found in Isaiah 54, verse 5, and it says, For thy maker is thine husband, Yahuwah of hosts, is his name and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. So even when bereft of our life's partner, Yahuwah is there for us to step in and to be our protector and provider, our companion. Amen to that. I love Paul's words in Romans chapter 8. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Yah, which is in Christ Yahushua our Lord. That's beautiful. One of my favourites, in fact. Uh, we taught it to our kids when they were little. It's a scripture song. Really, it's beautiful. Listen, if you've got any questions, comments, prayers, uh, any requests whatsoever, please visit our website, worldslastchance.com, and click on Contact Us. We always enjoy hearing from our listeners. Hello. This is Jane Lamb with today's Daily Promise from Yah's Word. Luke chapter 18 verse 1 says, quote, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Have you ever heard the expression, God works in mysterious ways? Well, recently I read a story that really reminded me of that statement. Late one Saturday night, a pastor was working alone in the office at his church. As it was getting near ten o'clock, he decided to call his wife on the church's landline to let her know he'd be home soon. He dialed the number, but it rang and rang and nobody answered. He thought that was odd. He knew his wife was at home and he wondered why she didn't answer. Maybe he'd caught her taking a shower. He decided to finish up a few last things and try again. This time his wife answered by the second ring. He was concerned that something might be wrong, so he asked why she hadn't answered before. She told him that nothing was wrong, it just hadn't rung before. While it was strange, they didn't think too much of it. After all, wrong numbers do happen. The following Monday, the pastor was again at the church when a call came in. A man he'd never heard before wanted to know why he had called him Saturday night. The pastor was confused. He didn't recognise the voice of the person calling, nor could he remember trying to call someone new. It was about ten o'clock at night, the man explained. It, it rang and rang, but I didn't answer. Oh, the pastor exclaimed, that's right. I was trying to call my wife. I'm so sorry. I hope I didn't wake you. 
No, that's fine. You didn't bother me, the stranger said. In fact, I was planning and all prepared to end it all Saturday night. Before I killed myself, though, I took one last minute to pray. I said, God, if you're there and if you care, please give me a sign. Otherwise, I'm going to end it all right now. Right then, my phone started to ring. I looked at the caller ID and it said, God Almighty. I was too afraid to answer the phone. Yahweh works in mysterious ways indeed. The church the pastor worked for was called God Almighty Tabernacle. That was too long to appear on the stranger's caller ID, so all that appeared was God Almighty. Nothing that concerns your happiness and well-being is too small for the Father's notice. He upholds the universe, and yet not a sparrow falls to the ground without his notice. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, Blessed be Yahweh, even the Father of our Lord Yahushua Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of Yahweh. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. just want to say how grateful I am for your presentation today, Dave. Uh, there's so much more than ever that I've realized before. And, and I notice how praise songs tend to avoid the subject of baptism, but the connection between baptism and the foot washing uh, to the blood and water that flowed from the Savior's side is, is so packed with meaning, isn't it? I mean, I've never seen it that way before. Well, Miles, you're not alone. A lot of Christians today, they just don't understand the importance and the significance of the blood and the water. Baptism is vitally important. Foot washing is also an important part of the Last Supper. It's all significant. The blood covers us and the water cleanses us. And they're both gifts of infinite love. Peter's words on the day of Pentecost are more significant than perhaps we've previously realised. Could you just read it one last time for us? It's Acts sure. chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptised in the name of Yahushua Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let every one of you be baptised for the remission of sins. This is an important part of the plan of salvation, and it's not for us to say that it's not needed. Robert Lowry was a 19th century American pastor. In, I think it was 1876, he wrote a hymn called Nothing But the Blood, and the lyrics go, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Yahshua. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Yahshua. Then the refrain goes, Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Yahshua. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Yahshua. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Yahshua. And it goes on from there. There is power in the blood, there is power in the water. And this is the Father's plan for our salvation. This really reminds me of the lyrics of the hymn that's come to be known as the Love Song of the Welsh Revival. I'd like to read it to close today's programme. I think it really will have a lot more meaning after today's discussion. And as I read this, I invite you to picture in your mind that cleansing flood, you know, the, the saviour of mankind hanging from the cross, the spear thrust so rudely into his side and the twin rivers, blood and water, that flow from his side. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the blood, when the wind
Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember? Who can cease to sing his praise? He can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the Mount of Crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide, through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love, like mighty rivers, poured incessant from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. Who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise. He can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. Thou alone shall be my glory, nothing in this world I see. Thou hast cleansed and sanctified me. Thou thyself hast set me free. Thou alone shall be my glory. Nothing in this world I see. Thou hast cleansed and sanctified me. Thou thyself hast set me free. Time is short, my friends. Turn to the Saviour now. Accept Yahweh's gift of love and be forgiven and cleansed. He'll never turn you away. He sacrificed his own son to save you and he's waiting with longing to make you his. We hope you can join us again tomorrow and until then, remember, Yahweh loves you and he is safe to trust. listening to WLC Radio. World's Last Chance is committed to bringing the gospel of the Kingdom of Yah to the world. Prophecy and current events indicate the Saviour will return in the very near future. This will be followed by gifting the saints with immortality and setting up Yah's kingdom here on earth. There's no time to waste. Accept the gift of salvation today and allow Yahweh to cover you with the righteousness of Christ. This program, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available on our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the homepage. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return.